Hello and welcome to Socially Holistic Podcast. Socially Holistic helps coaches and holistic entrepreneurs and women in heart-centered businesses make sense of social media so they can build their own online network and get more clients. As a heart-centered business owner, you do amazing work. Holly's mission in life is to help you help more people. Help us help more women in business with a five-star review of this podcast. Please leave one today over at iTunes. The more women who find out about this podcast, the more heart-centered businesses will be successful. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Socially Holistic Podcast, episode number 20. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I'm here with today's special guest, Sonia Gilv who is the founder of a company called Heads Up, which supports head teachers, otherwise known as school principals in the U.S. So welcome, Sonia. Hi, Holly. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? Great. So lovely to have you today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Because I think you've got a very unique background that has really helped you form your business. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll start from my degree, which was psychology. I then went on to train as a teacher um, and taught for a few years. I was primary school trained, so that's ages 7 to 11. Mm -hmm. I was planning to become an educational psychologist, hence the psychology and teaching, which is the route. But yeah, still pretty young in my early 20s and thought, actually, I'm I'm not entirely sure that is what I want to do. Um, So I think I'm going to go and explore a little bit more. Um, and then see where I get to. So at that point, I joined the John Lewis Graduate Management Trainee Scheme, which is all about developing leadership skills, grooming their future leaders, really, to take on more responsibility in high positions within the organization of John Lewis. That sounds like an amazing program. I know you've mentioned that to me before, but I just Mm -hmm. do all or do many corporations have a specific program like this to really form managers? Because I feel like so many companies just kind of push people into management without giving them the proper training. I, I totally, the answer is yes and yes. Um, <laughs> yes, many companies do have this. There are a lot of them. All, you know, big, I'd say big successful companies. And I guess mm. there's the clue, you know, yeah. they're, they're successful. And part of the reason they're successful is they do, you know, when I was hired, I wasn't hired to be a great retailer. I was hired to learn how to lead people mm. so yes quite a lot of, a lot of companies do Unilever Nestle BP you know whether you like them or not you know controversial <laughs> and non-controversial um councils and government do as well there's a very prestigious fast track scheme for civil servants mm. um it considers to be one of the hardest to get onto actually I'll say lo- I know local councils will have them as well there, there are lots of these out there lots of retail companies will, will as well and the second yes is yes a lot of companies almost seem to say, oh, you're good at doing this job, therefore you can be a manager. Yes. And being a manager and being good at a job, whilst, yeah, there's overlap and there is definitely credibility to be had from knowing how to do a job, which is why when I joined John Lewis, you start on the shop floor, you are a sales assistant, you've got to know what it's like to be there Mm -hmm. because that is where it all happens. And so that is a really important credibility. It doesn't mean that you naturally have managerial or even less so leadership skills. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Sadly, that's right. sadly, that's the way a lot of companies seem to work and organizations. And it's understandable why, but it's, I would say it's not the best way. And so what was your experience in this program? What kinds of things did you learn? Stacks. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely superb. And for someone like me who loves learning, you know, it doesn't just stop. The idea is that you get to your first kind of management position and then technically you're off the scheme. But once a grad, always a grad in John Lewis. Mm. The great thing about John Lewis, actually, and to sing their praises, which I happily do on a regular basis, is they have a real commitment to letting you continue your learning, mm. both professionally and privately as well. So the kinds of things I learned were really all centered around two things, how to lead and how to build better teams, how to get more out of each other. So it wasn't about developing charismatic leaders who you'd follow anywhere. I mean, you know, lead, leadership is obviously part of that. But actually, how do you really build fantastic teams? How do you get the most out of people? Mm. Which was, for me, where, where my focus always was. How do I get more out of my team? So lots of training, lot, you know, obviously lots of on-the-job experience um, because, you know, you'll t- be taken out for training, but you know, you're spending 99% of your time doing your job. Also, a whole range of experiences. I mean, in seven years, I did seven jobs and worked in seven branches. Oh, wow. So, you, you know, just the wealth of experience I was able to clock up in different contexts was amazing, actually. I loved it. And I think the other thing, the other thing that really gives you is, you know, you, you need to get to grips with things very, very quickly. 
both the content of your job. I mean, I was finance manager at Peter Jones. I then went and opened a brand new shop in Leicester as part of the selling team. I worked on the online side of the business. I worked in back offices, improving process. I was part of a massive turnaround project in head office where the area that I was responsible for was making millions of loss, make, to make millions of profit. You know, you've one got to get familiar with the business area very quickly, but also with the teams, you know, not just your immediate team, but the teams that you're working alongside, because as in, in any organization, you can't work in a silo. <laughs> so really, really valuable experience, really valuable. That sounds like it. So how did you transition from that company to your current business? Yes. So I left John Lewis and I trained to be a coach. Mm-hmm. When I was at John Lewis, a lot of people said, oh, you know, you're really good at, you're really good at teams, you're really good at coaching. And when I qualified to be a coach, I kind of realized that actually I really wasn't very good at coaching, but compared to other people, I was very good. <laughs> but, you know, these are things, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. I was really trying to figure out, I'd, I'd always said I wanted to run my own business, always wanted to be my own boss. And that was about as far as I'd kind of defined it, which as a coach, I know that's pretty woolly and pretty vague. <laughs> So I just started to think about, well, what am I passionate about? What have I enjoyed? It was always people centered. It's why I loved coaching. You know, as a teacher, very much I was, you know, very much focused on on the children. You know, you should hope all teachers would be. (laughs) You would Um, hope so. (laughs) You would hope so. Sadly, it's not always the case. But to be honest, 99.99% are, you know, and very, very much about developing people in my role in John Lewis. I always love psychology. Um, John Lewis sort of has these learning centres in every branch. Mm-hmm. So these are basically libraries, and you'll you'll find courses on learning Spen- French and Spanish and all these kinds of things. But you'll also find sections on leadership and uh, teams and so on. So I was always getting books out of there and reading them and putting them back and then getting another book and so on and so forth. And it was always around people, people management, effectiveness, how how to, you know, how to get more from people, how to, you know, get people being happier in doing, you know, what they were doing, kind of a virtuous circle. So as I kind of mulled it over and thought about it, I thought, well, I love what I've learned from business. I love the experience I've had. I, I love the fact that I've been trained in these particular ways, these skills and techniques. But actually, you know, I went into education because I was very passionate about, you know, educating the next generation, which gets so much bad press Mm. and really genuinely don't deserve it, I think. So the more I thought about it, the more I realized it was a combination of the two that was needed. Mm -hmm. That actually what I wanted to do was to take what I'd learned from business, also what I'd learned from education, because that was the thing. When I went from education to business, I took so much from there with me, mm. I kind of always wanted to do the other way around now. And say, okay, well, from education to business, business to education, how can I use this to help what I think is one of the most important roles in society, that of the head teacher, do their job better? Sounds like you've kind of come full circle then with your experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll end up leaping back the other way. I haven't yes. any plans to yet, but you never know. It seems to be just one foot in each camp hopping over. So what are some of the biggest challenges that you've overcome in building your business? I think getting clients and getting known, hmm. definitely. Ways were most effective for you in getting clients and, and getting known as? Yeah, certainly with, with schools, it, it was networking. So the key things was with, I found with schools was almost, almost finding a way in, finding some people who would be willing to give, you know, give me a try, who somebody who knew a head teacher who could say, look, you know, this, this is what this person's doing. They're trying, you know, would you chat to them or meet up with them? So I got my first few leads in schools um, and then deployed all my coaching techniques to really understand what it was they were looking for in the realm that I could support them. So I've always been very careful not to say yes to everything because there's some stuff that I'm really not very good at Mm -hmm. why would I do that it's unethical and it's not enjoyable so really kind of focused on okay what do they need that I can actually support with then do your best to absolutely over deliver to delight and impress them and then leverage those leads again you know if I've worked with one head and they like what I've done then I'd ask to go to a head teachers meeting or ask if there's anyone they'd know who would also benefit from what I can do and how I can help Mm -hmm. and literally kept spreading it like that it feels a bit slow at the beginning and and I guess it was but in some ways that was okay because there's a lot to learn when you're setting up your own business and then gradually and gradually it grew momentum so that's certainly what I did in the early stages later on what I've actually then gone on to do is run conferences for head teachers yes I saw that on your website you've run at least I think a couple of conferences now haven't you yeah I ran my fourth conference last week actually yeah so in the last year the last 12 months I've run four conferences all all aimed at providing support for head teachers on areas that they're 
you know, that, that are topical, that are, are issues that they're, they're grappling with or, or just trying to understand more about. Same in any industry, really. And of course, that's provided a wonderful platform in which to kind of get Heads Up out there and, mm. and talking to people about what it is that Heads Up does. Right. And to have you be perceived as an expert, of course, because you're the one organizing this conference. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, one thing that I see a lot of coaches struggling with is getting people in one place for a workshop or a conference or any kind of mm-hmm. physical in-person event. How did you how did you learn how to make that happen and how did you get enough people to make running these conferences viable? So the main the main method marketing methods I use were post and email. Mm, okay. And then to make them viable, to be honest, I learned a lot after the first one. If I was to run the first conference again, I mean, I sold out to 100 people and had a waiting list. That's spectacular. Um, yeah, no, it was a shock as well, because when you're running your first conference, you're thinking, oh, can I get 20 people? You know? so it was, I mean, I remember, honestly, I lived and breathed it for about three months in the in the run up to it. And I remember kind of a day before the conference, I said to my boyfriend, now, what am I going to think about after the conference? It's, like, it's, like, it's, like, well, it's like when people organise a wedding. It's you live and breathe it, and then when it's done, what do you do then? Where do you go? You plan um, another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is exactly what happened. But I'd say a key thing in there, and it's funny because from the first one to the second one, I was really able to, to kind of pile down my costs mm-hmm. and really kind of get them back down so that actually I didn't need very many people for the subsequent three conferences to make them at least break even and think to me conferences are twofold yes it's nice to earn money from them but actually it's about connecting with my audience Mm -hmm. so I don't want to do that a loss obviously but as long as I can break even then the conference goes ahead and the lower number I can break even on the more chance I've got the conference going ahead so you know that kind of whole cost management bit is really important and looking at where you can make make savings to reduce your costs so you can sell less tickets ideally you'll sell more um, but you need to sell less tickets but doing that without um damaging the quality of, of it i think part of the reason that first conference in fact i know part of the reason that first conference was so successful was well, it was on a real hot topic of the time mm. you know we, we picked something that was really relevant topic. to your niche Absolutely. And then the subsequent conferences have all been around things that people are struggling with and want to want to not struggle with it, obviously, want to find the solutions, want to get better at it. So, you know, they sold out. I mean, my next conference, I think, was about 50, 60 people. The next one was about 65. So, you know, these were still pretty sizable events. That's excellent. Now, of course, the more you work with head teachers, the more you understand what their particular challenges are. Yes. And what the common threads are between different people. Yeah. That's yeah. excellent. And so tell me a little bit about the other aspects of your business. You do a lot of leadership training. And, of course, that was a big element of what you learned at John Lewis. Mm. How, how does that work as part of your business today? Are you doing one-on-one with clients? Yeah. So I, I do a number of things. Um, I'll do coaching one-on-one with clients. Mm-hmm. But I'll also do training with leadership teams. Um, and what's really nice about that is one thing that's always fascinated me is team dynamics, how to get teams working more effectively, you know, and a high performing team. That's kind of the core of what everything I do kind of stems from. Um, so I will quite often, in fact, most of the time when I'm working with schools, what I'm doing is I'm going in and I'm working with their leadership team to help them move forwards. So that, that could be things like how they have difficult conversations, Mm-hmm. Yeah, how they manage this effectively because nobody likes them they're difficult the clues in the title <laughs> isn't it we don't like them but actually we can do them better uh things like vision and strategy i worked with a wonderful team actually I'm doing a lot of work with at the moment um in east london and they got this vision and they said to me they said you know we, we've worked on this and we've talked to our staff about it we've talked to governors and we've got input from everywhere we can and this is where we are And it just isn't quite working for us. We've got a load of statements and we can't even remember it. And yet we were the ones who created it and uh, we're stuck. Um, And after two days, we got this vision to a place where they totally got got what they wanted in terms of what their vision was. They, They could communicate this to their team really clearly and they had a plan to make it happen. And just the look on their face, I mean, it's almost kind of all the rewards you need. The look on their face, like, yes. That's what we've got. That's exactly what we've been trying. And it's just been in us. And we've not been able to get that out of ourselves as a team. You know, two days later, they've got that and a lot more. So a lot around vision and strategy, uh, which is really enjoyable. Really and of course, enjoyable. that's that's part of what you've learned in your business training. 
<laughs> yeah, well, partly. I mean, it's interesting, actually. Say, I only learned bits of that from my, my business training. The rest of that has come from ongoing reading and also coaching has been a big part of that as well. So it's a little bit of a, a combination of things. I think when I was in business, I used to get frustrated slightly because what would happen is senior leaders would disappear off for a few days and they'd come back and they'd go, this is our vision. And they'd come up with a sentence. <laughs> well, I'd be thinking, do you know what? I know you've worked really hard. I don't think you've just been on a jolly. The level, the way you have to think to come up, you know, to get this stuff out, it's really quite hard. So I know you've worked hard at that, but it doesn't mean as much to me as it does to you. Yeah. And so this falls short for me. And as much as I want to be behind it, and I will be behind it, I'm not behind it in the same way you are. And so that was always something that I thought was, well, so how do we do that? Because to come along and say, well, my vision is to be the most brilliant school in the world. <laughs> That's great, but how do we really get it so that people can connect with it? Mm. And so when I do visions with schools, it's almost the kind of, you know, that blend of learn from what goes well, but also learn from what doesn't go well. Yeah. It's that blend of, um, it's about um, values, it's about telling the stories, the pictures it creates to really create a compelling vision that one, you understand fully, <laughs> and then two, other people have got a far better chance of understanding. Yeah, because of course, if people that you're leading have no understanding of what your vision is, or they don't understand the why behind the vision, it's right. it's so hard to get them on board. And it's like, you know, they may go along with it, but their heart really isn't in it. Exactly. And, and, and quite often, a bit like me, I'll go along with it because, you know, what? I fundamentally just really like where I'm working. I like what we're doing. None of it jars with me. But actually, if you could get me to really get it, to really understand it, I'll do four times as much because it will create energy for me so it's a really good feeling when I work with a team and help them get to that place which we always do it's funny because whenever I start off I always think will this be the time that it doesn't work <laughs> um, so far so good the process has always worked so Excellent. that's really good fun um, another stuff I do is around improving team performance and creating more effective teams also developing um, flexibility within leadership style hmm. and they're just kind of like a bit of, an, a bit of an overview of the kind of things that I work with uh, with school leadership teams Mm -hmm. Let's go back a little bit about the training and difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. I think this is really, really important because having difficult conversations is such a huge part of management and yeah. people just don't get trained in it. And yeah. so they, 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 most people don't have the skills to do that naturally. So yeah. what kinds of challenges and things are you helping people with as far as difficult conversations? Oh, it's funny. I, I say this whenever I train. I mean, this, this term alone, so literally since... Well, it's been probably in the space of five weeks. I've trained over 100 head teachers and school leaders. Wow. And, and that's just this academic year. I've trained many more before then. So like you say, it is, it is something that there's a need for. And like you say, we just aren't taught how to do this. The challenges, the challenges that we face, one, getting people to have the conversation. But mm. quite often, once they've done the training, they're a lot more willing to have the conversation. Probably the other... The, <sighs> The biggest challenge I notice, and I'd say about 50% of people I work with struggle with this, is being really clear about what the conversation is about. It sounds daft, but if you think about it, if somebody's annoyed you, the chances are you've been grumbling away to yourself and moaning about it, and then they've done something else that's annoyed you, and it all gets piled into this pot, and it sits there festering away, bubbling, emitting some foul odours. <laughs> And of course, the, the, the longer it festers, the worse it gets. Exactly, exactly. And then in the end, when you say, well, actually, what's the problem? This whole, you know, explosion comes out. But what's really hard to figure out is, but what's the issue? Because we've almost, like, we can't see the wood for the trees anymore. We've lost sight of what the issue is. So one thing I really work with people on is really getting at the nub of what the issue is, because that's a really key part of having a successful, difficult conversation. Mm. Actually talk about the thing that needs to be talked about. Hmm. not all the other things that have been festering or you've almost you know it's like we fester so long we start to actually make stuff up in our own heads about how it goes we start to live the conversation we'd like to have or the shouting match we think would be useful and evidently would not be so that's one of the biggest challenges one getting people to have the conversation that is often resolved once they've done the training they feel a lot more confident but two an ongoing issue people I find with people and I will coach head teachers on this for some time after the training is how to really get at the nub of the issue so that they can talk about what actually matters. Mm -hmm. There's nothing worse. So it's okay. There's nothing worse, I think, than having a difficult conversation. You go in there, you do it, and then you come out and think, oh, actually, what I really need to talk about with them was this. That wasn't really the issue we covered. And, of course, you've been through all those emotions already. So far better to be going in and talking about the stuff that really matters. Exactly. And I'm sure the coaching part of your background has really, really helped you get to 
Yes. The crux of the issue. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Excellent. So is there anything else you'd like to share with us about how you've built your business? Because I think so many coaches, and I know you and I train together as coaches, Mm -hmm. we've seen people struggle to set up their business. What would you say are your top tips for building a thriving business based on coaching and and mentoring? I'd say keep learning. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a case of, oh, you've done your your coaching training or, you know, whatever it is that you've gone into and then it stops there and that's me done for life. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're going to need to learn things about business. If, if you've got the funds to, maybe you'll employ people who can do some of those things for you. You need to keep in your own area. I mean, yesterday I sat down and went through books, you know, to help increase my knowledge further. And I'm more, you know, if you're an expert, you're hungry to know more about your area of expertise. Mm-hmm. So, again, it's that whole keep learning, keep keep hungry for, for what's out there and for what's changing. There was this great thing on um, QI a little while ago, and it was talking about how, you know, the half-life of facts. Mm-hmm. That actually, what we accept as fact today in a year's time could be different. So that need to keep up to date, particularly in your particular area of expertise, is really crucial, I think. Mm-hmm. Except the fact that it will get hard. You know, that's part of it. Particularly if you're learning, you know, you go through that competency curve where you go, hey, I'm going to start my own business. It'll be great. It'll be fun. And then suddenly you realize all the things you don't know. How do I do a VAT return? Do I need to be VAT registered? Should, how do I do marketing? How do I get people into a venue? And that's the horrible bit where there's all this stuff you know you don't know. <laughs> but you didn't know you didn't know it until you started a business. <laughs> exactly. You had ignorant bliss at the beginning. But yes. then as you learn, you begin to know it and you have to think hard about it. I must remember to do that. I must write down a list of things and you've got to think more about these things but you start to be able to do it until the point it becomes quite natural you know how to tell a client what services you offer in a way that they think yes that's either useful to me or not as opposed to I do some stuff and I'm not really sure how to communicate it to you you know you you learn these things and they become unconsciously competent at them Um, but part of that is there may be a bit that's hard at first where you feel a bit rotten and a bit you know actually I, I don't know what it is that I'm, I'm doing I don't know how to do what I need to do and I'd say on the flip side of that enjoy the successes when they happen because <laughs> it's really easy in business and I do this myself to to almost like, oh yeah that's great that's done right what's next what's the next challenge I need to overcome but it's really important to take stock I think and just recognize when you've done well when you've achieved something that you wanted to achieve I think that's so important because otherwise we're just focusing on the lack what we don't yeah. have rather than what we already have yeah, someone I, I, know, I used to work with used to say we bank our wins. <laughs> and it's literally like that. You just bank them and move on to the next thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, one thing I do is I set myself targets um, and they're in a folder and I'll every now and then come across them and or, or at a certain point I'll review them. And it's just good to do because even if I haven't been really consciously focused on them, mm-hmm. it's amazing how many you actually reach. Yes. And again, it helps you kind of go, oh, actually, I've just ticked three of those off. Check me out. <laughs> <laughs> I feel good about myself. And I think sometimes the physical act of either crossing something off your list or ticking mm. it off, that it's just so satisfying because it's so <laughs> tangible almost. You yeah. see it, you've crossed it off. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And with those ones where you've got lists of targets you set yourself, keep them because they're really good to review over every now and then. Yeah. When you look back on a year and think, wow, my target then was to, I don't know, go to three head teachers meetings in a term. Mm-hmm. And now I've got head teachers calling me up and asking me to go to meetings and I can't fit them all in this. Te- you know, it can just help you realize how far you've come. Yeah. And I think that's really really important because Mm -hmm. it's so easy to forget the journey that we've already crossed um, because we're so focused on moving forward moving forward moving forward yeah definitely excellent so do you have any women business mentors are there any women in business who inspire you yes well I have a business coach that's Mel White who runs Naked Coaching and she's fab she's such a good coach really really good another person who I know through where I trained as a coach and who I'm beginning to kind of work with and go on some of her course in this course is Catherine Watkins mm. and again another person who you know and I'll say I put you into this category as well Holly I hope you don't mind but you know we're all of us we've kind of had those moments of struggle what is yeah. it we want to do yeah. I think I want to do this how do I take it forward what is it I'm naturally good at and then I think what you know we've all done you know yourself myself Mel Kath is we've just persevered yep yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't really think that that's the key difference. We just, you know, there were so many points, and I think for all of us that we could have given up, 
and just said, you know what, I'll, I'll go back, I'll go back and get a job, I'll have a regular income coming in, and okay, at some point I'll wake up and feel unfulfilled perhaps because I know there's something else I could be doing or want to be doing, but that's easier. But I think we all just really kept searching, kept searching, kept trying, kept looking, until one day you suddenly go, oh, this is what really... This is what I love doing and what other people love me doing for them as well. <laughs> this is where I'm meant to be. This is my place in the world. It's, it's that whole struggle of finding the niche, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I, I know we've had this conversation so many times <laughs> yeah. um, throughout the journey, but it's, it's just so important. And I, I, I understand how people resist niching because mm-hmm. it's, it's not easy, but it's so worth it once you just get it and it all clicks into place. Yeah, I think I think there's almost two parts to that. I don't know what you think, but I think there's the finding the niche, but there's also finding what it is that you want to do. Yeah. And it can happen, either one can come first. I want to work with this type of pit person, but I'm not sure exactly what, as Kath would say, what my gift is. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Kath, Kath's gift is selling selling in, in a heart-centered way, so, you know, yeah. and, and she's incredible at it. Oh, she's amazing. Um, exactly. So, you know, and she does that with a certain you know, with certain people, because that's where she wants to work. So I think there's almost those two parts, kind of who do you want to work with and what do you want to do with them? Yes. And either one can come first, but it's quite hard to figure out because we're not born with it tattooed on our hands. You know, this is what you're naturally good at. Here's your strength. And, you know, and, is- and it's something that we never learn in school. No, no. And it, I read this great, brilliant book called Social, The Social Animal, and there's a great line in it, and it says that at school we're asked to be good at lots of things, but life asks us to be good at one thing. Yes. And I just thought, that's so true. <laughs> so true. That is so true. And and we're just not prepared for it. And I just, I remember yeah. back to when I was getting ready to, you know, graduate from high school and go to mm. university. And I was applying to all these schools and I was just thinking, you know, I don't know what I want to do. <laughs> I mean, yeah. like, you're just too young and you've never focused on it. I mean, I, w- yeah. I must have gone through six or seven different things that I wanted to be when I grew up when I was a kid and and you just really don't get that kind of training no it's it's so true and it's funny it's something that actually I work on a little bit with um a colleague who's an educational psychologist or a friend who's an educational psychologist and as a byproduct of a lot of the work I do in schools and the coaching I do I quite often get asked to work with students Mm -hmm. His parents say, look, you know what, we didn't really know what we wanted to do and we've done all right in life but actually if we were there we'd do things differently now yeah can you help my son or my daughter have a better chance of doing something that they love when they're older and not just, oh, well, you got A's in this to so go and do that at university and therefore you do well in this part at university to so go and do that as a job and then wake up at 30 and go, how did I get here? Yeah. I was 16 a minute ago and now I'm here and I'm not sure it's right. It's a toughie to crack, but it's well worth cracking, I think. Yeah, and I, I wish more young people would get coaching Mm -hmm. or I wish their parents would realize how important it is yeah I think it's coming it'll take some time but I think it's it's beginning to happen Hmm. yeah Yeah. I think so little by little so is there anything else you would like to share with us about how you built your business or what you're doing today or anything at all (laughs) um no, I mean, for me, really, my, I'm looking to take my business up to another level every every year, and I count years as academic years, um, so September to kind of July, June, July time. I I try and think about how can I notch my business up another level. I think it'd be very easy to kind of go, oh, okay, you know, it's kind of trotting along quite nicely. I know for me, that means I'll get bored. Yeah. So, okay, so what am I going to do that's different? What am I going to do that excites me? Not so different that I undo everything I've done, but it's the next natural progression and evolution. Mm. Um, and so you know that whole point about keep learning and actually I guess by that what I mean is keep investing you know you can buy books for a tenner or less of of Amazon but there's also you know go on courses as well that seem relevant to you that seem that they'll help so I've just signed up for Daniel Priestley's uh, Key Person of Influence KPI program Mm -hmm. and so I'm looking to that then to help me grow my business up another level you know and and that's kind of that's my thing for this year last year it was conferences Uh This year it's KPI, and then we'll see what next year. KPI might need two years. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <We'll see. laughs> That's great. Uh, but, you know, always be looking for how can I sensibly grow my business next in a direction that's right for who I am. Mm-hmm. I think that's yeah. really important, actually. It's got to be a, a model that fits you as a person. Exactly, and it's got to be something that allows you to be your authentic self and really yes. re- reflects your values. 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Before we sign off, I'd like you to share where people can find you online. Mm. Okay, so you can find out more about Heads Up at www.ukheadsup.com. Um, and if you want to get in touch or you've got any questions about how we can help uh, your school or you as an individual, then get in touch. There's contact details there. And we'd love to hear from you. Excellent. And I think one thing that's really important to note, I, as I saw on your website, you work with head teachers all over the world. So you can work with people on an international basis as well. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And their teams. Excellent. That That's really good. So do you work by Skype or how do you? It depends what the work is. So um, if it's like coaching, yes, it would be Skype. If it's if it's team building, then actually it's going to be in situ. So you're out there with the teams, unless they fancy coming to the UK for a bit. But normally they prefer to me, <laughs> me to go elsewhere. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's so good. I think really think that the education system needs more people like you and businesses like yours, because I think a lot of people that are working in education don't think to get that help that they need. It, you know, it's funny. I think you're right. What I find um, really hard, I've had so many head teachers now. And, you know, my business, I want to make a difference. I, I, you know, I'm not interested in doing bits of work that don't actually have an impact on the teams I'm working with. And the amount of head teachers who've either said to me, so, for example, after my successful difficult conversations training, that's the best bit of training I've ever had. Or head teachers who said, you know, the money I spent with Heads Up last year was the best bit of money I spent that entire year. Mm. Um, and so I think, you know, there are heads out there who can really see the value in investing in their people and their teams. Because at the end of the day, that's the only thing that makes a difference in schools, isn't it? In any organisation, it's people all yeah. the way. It's all about people. Yeah. So it's it, again, it's growing. There are there are, there's definitely an increase, I, I think, happening out there in how much people are willing to to focus on their teams. Excellent. That's good to hear. Hopefully mm -hmm. education will be changing in the coming years. It always will be. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Sonia, for being a part of our show and and thank you for sharing all of your knowledge and your wisdom and your business experience. I think it's been really, really interesting. Our oh, pleasure. Thank you for, for having me on. It's oh, been a real pleasure. Excellent. And um, thank you to our listeners for listening and remember to visit sociallyholistic.com forward slash SHP20 for the show notes on this episode. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to the Socially Holistic Podcast with your host, Holly Wharton. Please help us help more women in business by giving us a five-star review of this podcast. The more women who find out about this podcast, the more successful businesses there will be. So please leave a five-star review today over at iTunes. Thank you.